I bought the house in Macclesfield that Ian Curtis used to live in and had only been moved in a day and a half when the neighbour who lived opposite came over and asked me if John Ireland had been round. I don't know, I said. What does he look like? Big fella with crooked teeth, the man said. No, no one's been round yet. You're the first, I said. He'll come round, John Ireland, and he'll ask you if he can buy the lease on your garage, the man said. What should I say? Well, it depends on whether you want to sell the lease on your garage or not. There was a set of eight garages at the top of the road, the doors painted with thick black gloss, and they presented an intimidating blank wall of wood you had to walk past every day. I wondered what Ian Curtis had thought of this black wall. Who is John Ireland and why does he want my garage? He's bought the other seven garages and and we think, the street, that he wants them all. Oh, okay, I said. Yours will complete the set. Did the previous owner not want to sell it? No, the previous owner of your place had a classic car. It's only people with classic cars who need garages nowadays. It's insurance. What was the car? 1960s Sunbeam. Nice. Yes, but you don't have a classic car, do you? No. Well then, he'll definitely expect you to sell it to him. I wondered how I might use the garage if I kept it. I could store things in it, but my possessions consisted mainly of records and books, items which would not bear well in the damp old garage. I really couldn't think of any use for it, and if the price was right, I must admit I would be happy to sell it to anyone. I didn't even mind what he wanted to use it for. Is it connected to Ian Curtis? No, definitely not. John Ireland doesn't know anything about Joy Division, and Ian Curtis never owned that garage anyway. It was bought by a later owner off of someone else. These garages always seem to be changing hands then. The man paused to watch a silver Ford Focus crawl up the street and turned to go past the black garages before it disappeared from view. Yes, it looks that way. The following evening, John Ireland knocked on the door. He was a tall man and wide like a rugby player, with ruddy skin that looked soft. And I noticed the crooked teeth the neighbour had told me about, which I was surprised at, because he looked from his clothes to be the sort of person who could afford to get those sorted out. I wondered if you wanted to sell the lease on your garage, he said. I'm not sure, I said. Well, if you're not sure, he said, have a think about it. I'll pop round next week. How much are you offering? Well, the going rate is £2,500, so how about that? Plus two fifty dollars as a sweetener. Right, I said. There seemed no harm in it, and the money was attractive, but I decided I would take the option of the week he had offered me to think about it. The next day, I explored the area a bit more. I walked past the row of black garages and stopped at the end of the street where it met the main road which was a steep hill that continued in a straight line all the way down into the centre of Macclesfield. I looked down the hill and thought about how strange it was that this part of town was so high up. I'd been used to South Manchester, but everything was flat. I crossed the road and went into the park, where there was a group of middle-aged women playing crown green bowls. I watched them for a time. Then I went over to a run-down looking leisure centre with metal shutters over the windows. A gaudy mural had been painted on its walls depicting smoking mill chimneys and industrial scenes, a bit like a 1970s hippie version of a Lowry painting. I went back to the row of garages. They looked abandoned, as if no one had ever opened them in their whole existence. I wondered why they were all painted black and not different colours to reflect the personalities of the different people who owned them. Then I remembered that they were all owned by John Ireland apart from mine. The following week, John Ireland knocked on my door, and when I answered, he asked me if I'd made up my mind. About what? I said. Selling your garage. Oh, yes, I said, you you can have the garage. Great, he said. Do you want to go through a solicitor? I don't know, I said. How about a gentleman's agreement? That would be fine, I said. John Ireland came into the hall and sat down on the stool that I kept there for these sorts of occasions. He brought out a checkbook and a small stubby ballpoint pen, wrote me a check for the amount we had agreed and held it out to me. Before I took it I said, there's one condition. What's that? 
he asked, yanking his hand away from me, as if I was about to set his check on fire. I'd like to know why you want to own all the garages, and what you keep in them. Then the deal is off, he said, and he lifted the check up and tore it in two, with an expression on his face of intense concentration, as if he was listening very carefully to the tearing sound it made. He stood up, stuffed the two halves into his back pocket, walked quickly towards the door, and put his hand on the handle. Then he turned to face me, as if to say something, but must have thought better of it, because he turned away again, threw open the door, and left. I watched him stomp down the road and round the corner. I knew he would enter the Frog and Railway and sit on his own at the end of the bar, scowling into his beer, because I had often seen him through the window in the same position when I passed the pub on my way to the bus stop. Another week passed, and every evening of that week, at different times, I saw John Ireland standing outside my garage, staring at it. When I went over to say hello, he didn't answer, just shook his head and moved away down the road, as if he'd been doing something entirely normal. Eventually, I cracked and went to find him in the Frog and Railway. He was sitting on his favourite high stool at the end of the bar, watching a European football match on the large screen. I sat down next to him and looked ahead at the mirror and all the whiskies, gins, brandies and liquors. Listen, I said, I don't really care why you want to own all the garages. If it means that much to you, you, you can have it. You can, you can drop off the cheque tomorrow, here's the key. He turned slowly to face me, and I don't think I've ever seen a man look so happy. He took the key and gripped it tightly in his fist for a few moments. Then he shuddered, closed his eyes before letting out a small, barely audible whimper. It was though some uncanny power was being transferred to him from that small object. When he opened his eyes again, they were full of tears, and he squeezed my shoulder and looked me straight in the face. Thank you so much, he said. This is not something that a man like you could ever understand. As I watched him leave, I looked at his half-finished pint on the bar and wondered what he meant by a man like me. I didn't know I was a man like me. I never knew what people meant when they were talking about me like that, saying things like, I think you're really going to like this, or I don't think this will be your type of thing, or... You're not really the sort of person we're aiming this at. Later that night, I was eating a kebab from the ghost chili takeaway in town while watching out of my window and I saw John Ireland walk up the street and over to his now wholly owned row of black carriages. He opened up his new acquisition with the key I had given him and I was glad to see that it worked because I hadn't opened it myself to see what was in there. It was an up and over door and he reached in and flipped a switch and when light flooded the space, I could see even from that distance that the garage was completely empty. He didn't go inside, just looked at this empty space for a long time, and then closed the door again, locked the padlock, and after a long pause, patted the door of the garage as if it was the flank of a much-loved animal. There was a noticeable spring in his step when he set off back down the road to his little terraced house.